those two squares were cut out from a single sheet of paper, printing paper that I took from my office. I put them together like so and clamp them together with a binder clip. Actually, when you do this with friends and family at home, you can use your fingers to support those two sheets. But if I use fingers, people start accusing me of cheating. So let's introduce some objectivity by using an instrument. So there is a binder clip there. And if I hold those squares like this, they stick together. Of course, you say, because they are made of the same material. They react the same way, they sag the same way under gravity. So there's no reason why, you know, they don't stick together. But when I turn them around, they separate. So on one side, they stick together. On the other side, they separate. But there is more to this. This side, you see that they are separating. And flipped over, you recall, it was the sticky side. While keeping the squares on the separating side, let's make the binder migrate to the next edge. OK, it used to be here, and now it's gone here. And I kept them on the separating side, but this time, supported on this edge, they stick together. And the other side, which used to be the sticky side, now separates. So I didn't do anything violent, like you know, chemical treatment or pooling and so on, but I did some, something to them. And this whole thing comes from the interest in anisotropic materials. That is, properties of materials that depend on direction. You know, this direction, this direction, different. The modern method of manufacturing paper pulls the paper out of a big, big roller. So it introduces some sort of graininess in one direction, which makes maybe the resulting paper this direction, this direction, not strictly equivalent. Now, for all practical purposes, this non-equivalence is almost always invisible and immaterial. But playing with paper, and playing with toys like this, you can make them come out as follows. So let's make it a bit more clear. Because I'm very fond of toys, this is a toy, but I've brought a toy of a toy. It's a secondary toy, if you like. I'm tr using another toy to illustrate as the first toy. If you crease paper like this, it's quite flexible in this direction. In this direction, it becomes stiff. You can't bend it anymore. Now, that's the ancient technology of corrugated surface, of course. But for mathematically minded people, I might lay by the point. Because I curved it in this direction already, if I try to curve it in the other direction, I would introduce what is called a non-zero Gaussian curvature, which I can't do without violence to a paper which, to begin with, had zero curvature. And curvature turns out to be an invariant. That is, as long as you don't tear, stretch, and so on, curvature must be the same. So if it's zero to begin with, it's zero always. So the Gaussian curvature, in a nutshell, is acting as a stop to being bent. Or if you like, you know, when we crease a sheet of paper or any surface, one of the useful reasons for creasing is that when you crease a sheet or membrane or surface like this, it becomes more flexible in this direction, but suddenly introduces a bit of rigidity in this direction. So creasing is a mechanism for introducing directional rigidity. OK, let's go back. When I saw this uh, sheet of paper from my office, well, I couldn't tell the microscopic fiber anisotropy and so forth precisely because it's too small. But I don't have to know anything. I just cut out two squares next to each other. And and when I assemble them, I put them one on top of the other, like so, by rotating one on top of the other by 90 degrees. And in this toy model, you'll see exactly what happens. If I support those two objects like this, they stick together because the stiff one is at the bottom, supporting the flexible one at the top. But when I turn around, they can separate because the flexible one can sag, but stiff one sticks out. And when I migrate to the next edge, the sticky and non-separating sides swap their roles. Almost certainly, this is what is going on microscopically in, in this model. When I first made this, on a normal sheet of paper, I simply couldn't see the small scale structures. But it doesn't matter. I just cut two squares and rotated one on top of the other by 90 degrees. That's all you have to do. In retrospect, bookbinders know this because you have to use the paper in the right direction, apparently. If you use it in the wrong direction, the book becomes very difficult to open. Whereas if you line it in the correct direction, it becomes a very easy book to use. And so people who work with paper know this, of course, from experience. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm quite fond of Japanese calligraphy. You might have seen this is a tradition that ultimately comes from China. You just use ink and a very sort of stark sheet of paper. And then you do all sorts of things with just black ink, painting or 
calligraphy. I'm not so good at this, so I can't really tell the difference, but I know that the great masters insist on uh, using paper that is manufactured in the traditional way. That is, you start from some sort of pulp mush and you let it sediment without pulling in any direction and then you compress, apparently. That's uh, how you make the paper. So that the little fibers are randomly oriented. In other words, it is quite isotropic. It's quite um, direction independent. And when those masters draw things like that, well, they can go in all directions freely. Whereas they say, well, if you use the commercial in a modern paper which has some directionality, well, you know, this stroke is not compatible with that stroke and so forth, they complain. I mean, I, as I say, I can't tell the difference, but there are people who are sensitive enough to tell the difference. So there are examples like this too. Yet one more example from really daily life is this. I don't know if it's the first time that toilet paper makes an appearance in number file. If you take a tissue paper, you can try to tear it straight. And in one direction, it's fairly easy to do so. But if you take the same paper and try to tear it in the perpendicular direction, I've just torn it in this direction, but now I tear, it's basically impossible to go straight. You can't tear it. And that's certainly because of the anisotropy of the paper. There's a difference between tearing down like this and tearing across like this. I found this toilet paper from the bathroom of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute MSRI. And I was amused to note that this toilet paper, I mean, it's a roller like this, is easy to tear straight in this direction along the length. But across the width, it's impossible to tear straight. And I thought, haha, that is funny. But on second thoughts, I realized that, of course, it has to be that way. Because you see, when you tear toilet paper, you want it to be very difficult to tear, except along the perforations where you deliberately introduce perforations to uh, it to be terrible in some units. So, of course, it should be easy to tear along the length. And across the width, you want it to be difficult to tear. So every day I become a little smarter. So you can do this at home. In this direction, it's very easy to tear, but in this direction, it's, it's almost impossible, except along the perforation where I can, I can tear quite nicely, as the paper should. In the same direction, that's why they circulate in the same direction that I'm swirling, because they are not um, talking to one another, they are independent particles. In contrast, when you increase the crowdedness, well, whatever linear momentum I input into the system,